So in the first video this week, we talked through kind of the intuition and, and kind of formally defined the nested logit model. And in the last video, we talked through how we can think about the nested logit model as actually being this kind of two-step logit model, first choosing nests and then choosing alternatives within a nest. And I think that by thinking about it that way, we can really understand some of the properties that come out of the, out of the nested logit model. But first, let's just define the actual choice probability for the nested logit model. In the last video, we talked about what this looks like for each of those steps when we think about each step as being a logit model. If we multiply those together, we get this expression for choice probabilities here. It looks pretty messy, but ultimately, if you knew representative utilities, we've got a representative utility term here, and let me clarify, we're going back to our original representation of, of representative utility here, where it's, it's everything, the nest attributes and the alternative attributes put together into one term. We've got a representative utility here, a representative utility here, and then a representative utility in the denominator. So we need to know representative util utilities. And then we've also got all of these lambda terms floating around. We've got a lambda k here, here, here. And then in the denominator, we've got these lambda l's just because uh, we've got different indexing going on in the numerator and the denominator. But really, that's all that's here. It looks a little messy, but we've got representative utilities just like we did in the logit model. And now we've also got these lambda parameters to, to think about. Uh, but if you knew representative utility, and these lambda parameters, you could calculate choice probabilities. The, uh, the expression here is a little more complicated than it was for logit, but we still have this kind of relatively clean, especially once we see what we have to do, what, what things look like next week, we'll see that this is still a relatively clean and easy to calculate closed form expression for choice probabilities. Um, I do just wanna say one more thing about these lambda terms or, or maybe just reiterate these lambda terms once again, these are gonna be a measure of independence in nest K. And those are gonna be parameters that we actually estimate. So we're gonna, the model is gonna tell us how correlated each of our nests are. So if lambda K is a measure of independence, we can think about one minus lambda K as being an indicator of correlation. So in other words, values close to one uh, are relatively independent. Values close to zero are gonna be relatively dependent. And I keep saying between zero and one because when these parameters are between zero and one, our nested logit model is going to be consistent with a random utility model, with, with, ran, with utility maximization. If they get outside of that range, the interpretation is going to be a little less clear, especially if we try to tie it back to thinking about utility maximization. But as long as they're between zero and one, uh, we can think about this as, as being the outcome of a, a utility maximizing agent in the random utility model. And once again, these choice probabilities are important because these, you know, we're going to want to find the parameters. We're going to have parameters inside our, our representative utility, just like we did for the logit model. Now we've got these new lambda parameters. We're going to want to find the sets of parameters that make these choice probabilities as close as possible to the, uh, to the observed, observed outcomes. So we can see the kind of more flexible substitution patterns of the nested logit model if we think about taking the ratios of choice probabilities. We did this in the logit model and that's what showed us the uh, IIA property. We can do it here. And what we see is, you know, if here we're taking the ratio of the choice probability of I, alternative I in nest K to the choice probability of alternative M in nest L. And what we get when we look at this ratio is this expression right here. It's a little messier once again than what we had when we took ratios in the uh, logit choice probabilities. But there's one important property that we can see here. This ratio is going to depend on here inside the, the parentheses, we're adding up all over all alternatives in nest K. And down here in the bottom, we're adding up over all alternatives in nest L. So this ratio, unlike the logit model, where this ratio only depended on 
each of these individual alternatives themselves, now this ratio of choice probabilities will depend on all of the alternatives in nest K and all of the alternatives in nest L. It won't, however, depend on any alternatives in any other nest. So we've kind of broadened the, uh, the set of alternatives that are gonna enter this ratio now. And so what we're gonna say here, this, this might kind of sound similar to what we said with IIA, it's just that now we're gonna have a property that we call IIN, independent of irrelevant nests. So if there is a third nest out there, it doesn't show up in this expression at all. And so this ratio is not gonna depend on anything happening in that third or fourth or fifth or any other nests that are out there. The ratio between I and M will only depend on these two nests. So we're gonna call that the independence of irrelevant nests. And this fact comes from thinking about the nested logit model as being that two-step procedure where the first step is a logit model among the nests. And so you can kind of think if there's IIA in that first step where we're choosing nests, then kind of the way that that actually manifests in the nested logit model is this independence of irrelevant nests. When we're thinking about comparing two nests to one another, all that matters are those nests and not any other nests. This expression actually simplifies though, if I and M are in the same nest. So if they're both in nest K, then all of this stuff out here actually simplifies away and we're left with a much simpler expression that now we have an expression that only depends on alternative I and alternative M. So this looks more like something we had in the logit model. So this ratio, the ratio of two choice probabilities for alternatives in the same nest, that only depends on these two alternatives themselves and the, and, and the lambda parameter for, for the nest, but, but not any of the other uh, uh, choice prob uh, you know, representative utilities for any of the other alternatives in, in this nest even. And so we're gonna say in this case, IIA does in fact hold. So for alternatives within the same nest, IIA holds. Alternatives in different nests, we said this new independence of irrelevant nests property holds, but when we're in the same nest, independence of irrelevant alternatives holds. And this just follows from the second step of that kind of two-step procedure, where we thought of the second step as being a logit model, uh, a logit choice among the alternatives in the nest. And so once we're in that nest, in the second step, we're making a logit choice, and that, uh, that means that the IIA property is going to hold within that nest. And so what this means is uh, we're going to get some really interesting, more interesting and more flexible elasticities than what we had for the logit model. And so let's start by thinking about what the kind of own elasticity of alternative I, which is in nest K, what that will be with respect to its own attribute Z. So once again, we're thinking about the elasticity of alternative I with respect to some attribute Z. This could be the price or cost or time or whatever attribute we want of that of that of that that same alternative this is going to be our uh, elasticity expression here it's going to depend on the uh i guess i should have said i kind of skipped a uh, one assumption that went into this we're we're going to assume that we've got representative utility just to make uh sorry we have linear representative utility just to make these expressions a little simpler so i didn't put that on the slide but no one of the things that goes into calculating these particular elasticities is, is linear representative utility. So then this own elasticity is gonna depend on the parameter on that attribute, the attribute itself, and then this, this formula here that's gonna depend on the, uh, that lambda parameter for the nest, 
the uh, this kind of second step choice probability. Once we're in the nest, what is the probability of choosing the alternative? And then just what's the choice probability altogether? I'm not going to talk through the whole expression, but you have it here if you ever need to use it, um, which you might on a problem set. Here it is. It's more complex than what we had for, for the logit model. But what's going to be really interesting here is to look at these cross elasticities. So this is where we're saying, what's the elasticity of alternative I in nest K? if we were to change some attribute of a different alternative. So what's the elasticity of alternative I with respect to an attribute of alternative M? Well, now this cross elasticity is going to depend on whether I and M are two alternatives kind of in question here, whether they are in the same nest or whether they are in different nests. And this is where we get that kind of additional uh, flexibility and really additional realism that comes from the nested logit model versus the logit model. If you remember back to the logit model, it didn't make this distinction. Every cross elasticity was exactly the same, no matter which alternative we were thinking about. If we changed one attribute, every other alternative had the same cross elasticity. But now the cross elasticity is going to depend whether you are in this, whether the alternative is in the same nest or not. So if the alternative is in the same nest as the, uh, uh, so, so if, the, if the alternative that we're, we're changing some attribute for, if that is in the same nest as the alternative that we're thinking about, what's the effect on it? If those are in the same nest, then we get this first expression here where it's going to depend on, once again, the parameter, the data itself, the choice probability, and then this expression here that's going to depend on the, uh, these lambda, the lambda parameter for the nest that both of these alternatives are in, and then the choice probability that the decision maker chooses that nest. So I think there's some... Uh, there's probably some intuition here that makes sense why these kinds of, uh, you know, the, the independence or the correlation within a nest is going to enter this kind of elasticity for how you might substitute within a nest. If these two alternatives are in different nests though, then because the, uh, because there's no correlation between them, between their, their random utility or unobserved utility terms, the elasticity is exactly as it was in the logit model. It's just the, uh, the parameter on the attribute times the attribute itself times the, the choice probability. And once again, I just wanna point out one thing here. What we're thinking about here, I just wanna make this really clear. We're thinking about changing some attribute of alternative M But we want to know how is that going to affect choice probabilities for alternative I. We still have the case that nothing about alternative I itself is showing up anywhere in either of these expressions. Yes, whether I is in the same nest as M or not will depend what will affect which which expression we use. And certainly these nest specific uh, kind of parameters and choice probabilities will enter, but we don't actually see an I itself anywhere in, in these expressions. So, so you, you might imagine we're still, you know, we, we still aren't uh, maybe being as completely flexible in these substitution patterns as we might be. Uh, as we might want, let's say. And then here I've just shown you how you can calculate some of these choice probabilities that show up. The, the, you know, the choice probability of choosing any nest, you can think of that as just the sum of the choice probabilities for all of the attributes in that nest. And then this kind of conditional choice probability that you get in the, uh, in the second step, you can think about that as just the ratio of the uh, alternative choice probability to the nest choice probability. So if you're ever calculating these things, it might be useful to have these kinds of uh, these kind of definitions in, in place to help with that. So those are the main properties. Really, the main property there is that we have these more flexible substitution patterns. It's going to be really nice and help us get closer to, to uh, kind of re representing the kind of real substitution patterns we see in real choice settings.
In the next video, I'm going to talk about some of the empirical considerations we might want to have in mind as we actually start estimating a nested logit model.